From God's side of the virtual hardwood, it's the NLSC Podcast. This is episode number 448. I am Andrew, Andrew in our forum, and Andrew NLSC on Twitter. With me, as always, is my co-host, Derek. He is DP3 in our forum, and DP384 on Twitter. Derek, good to be talking to you again. How's it going? It's going well. Happy birthday. Thank you. For uh, our listeners, uh, today is Andrew's birthday. And uh, are you feeling like an all-star today, Andrew? Uh, I'm, I'm feeling kind of old because it, it dawned on me that I'm now the same age that uh, our favorite player, MJ, was uh, when he came back with the Wizards. So, And that felt very old back in the day. So, And it's as I've said before, my 20-year high school reunion is coming up next month. So, uh, yeah, I'm kind of peering at, uh, at the beard and the hair and, and looking for gray hairs and hoping they're not there. Yeah, I'll say this, though. You know, Jordan was playing through, you know, for age 38 into, you know, age 40, and he was still an all-star and, and playing incredibly well. You know, Tom Brady's still playing professional football, and he he's 45 years old. So you can't really, and I said this on a prior podcast, you can't really consider yourself too old or even old if there's people out there playing at a very high level in professional sports at that age or older. Well, it's true. So, that's true. Yeah, so I would look at it that way. Like, you're not even close to old. I mean, when you're 45, you can say, hey, Tom Brady was playing football. That's right. Maybe, and maybe he'd still, and you know, maybe he'd still be playing football when you're 45 at this rate. Um, Vince Carter throwing down, uh, you know, Vince Carter throwing down between the legs dunks at 41, 42. Yeah, uh, I mean, these right. are these are people, these are men who are uh, far greater athletes than I ever was in my prime. But uh, I, I have to I admire them even more because knowing how my knees feel and back and you know, I've got to be a sciatica and whatnot uh, from running back in the day, uh, for them to be still playing and, and often at a high level at that age. Uh, the, the, these guys are, are tremendous athletes. It just really drives that home. Yeah, it just blows you away. Yeah, that Vince Carter stuff where you were seeing him throw down 360s uh, during shoot-around. Easily, casually. Or easily. Um, it's just super impressive. The reason I, why I asked you if you felt like an all-star, um, which it sounds like you do. You feel like an all-star at this age. And, you know, life's going well for you. Um, the, the team, you may be feeling like an all-star, but the team of NBA players that ha- that share a birthday with you is definitely the furthest thing from an all-star team. Yes. I'm Tom, sure you've Tom, looked this up before. Tom Talbot, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so this is this would be your starting five. This is an NBA team built from players that share a birthday with our friend Andrew. Center, be Manute Bull. Not bad. That's all right. Power forward, Tom Tolbert. Small that, that, forward. That's less good. <laughs> Yeah, that's not good. Small forward, Dave DeBusher. Mm. That's not bad. That's not bad. Um, shooting guard, Alan Anderson. Yeah. Not really feeling. That. No, not really yeah. feeling that one. No, no. I didn't really have a very good NBA career. I mean, you're not wait- at this moment with this lineup here. You're probably going to win what I don't know, ten games if that in a yeah. season. Yeah. Um, I mean, DeBusher is probably that- the, is easily the best. Yeah, oh my god, by far. Um with Bull, with uh, Manu Bull being second. Uh and point guard Roger Fegley. Hmm. So, um you know, the, he played for the Spurs and whatnot in the early 80s. So, not exactly an all-star team Andrew and your bench is even worse. Yeah, yeah, no, I I don't think I'm going to be uh, winning on that front. Uh in the entertainment and the arts, I do have the uh the great Oscar Wilde shares the birthday, and uh, Angela Lansbury, who just passed away a few days ago, actually, also October 16th, you know, Murder, She Wrote, of course. Uh, so I've kind of got more um, <laughs> more quality in the entertainment world <laughs> than in the basketball world on that one. Although I will say this, because you could also start her at point guard instead of Roger Fegley. <laughs> you got uh, Sue Bird. Uh, assist, she wrote. Sue Bird. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. 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 Yeah, so there you go. Yeah, so Sue Bird is also shares a birthday with you That's good. and um, she's a WNBA legend. So that makes your team a little bit better, but uh, yeah, isn't that wild? That's uh, not a good birthday team. We'll have to do the same thing when my birthday comes around. Oh, it's only about, about a month away, I believe. No, oh, it's coming up. Um, and you still haven't sent me your address in order for me to send you the uh, Lakers versus Celtics. I, uh, yes, I do need uh, to uh, hit you up with that. Yes. Yeah. Because I got to send that over to you. Um, but before we started recording this podcast, Andrew and I, got a game in on nba showdown 94 for sega genesis and i actually hosted it 
worked well on Andrews and we actually ended up having a, a good game, some high flying dunks with Pippen and, and, and Drexler and Steve Kerr came in in the fourth quarter, tried to save the day with a few threes and whatnot. And actually I think pulled you within eight. Yes. In almost the uh, fourth almost quarter. Around. He was scaring me. Yeah. He was scaring me there. Um, but there's a couple things that stood out to both of us gameplay wise, but I wanted to talk, I wanted you to talk about this because I know that you are a huge fan of NBA Live 95, you know, NBA Live 96. Oh, and of whatnot. course, yes. yes. And the faster gameplay. And, you know, when EA Sports, NBA basketball really started taking off, I, I wanted you to talk about the gameplay on Showdown in comparison to the games that came after it shortly after. So I've mentioned it in, a, in an article before that, and probably on the podcast as well, that I think Live 95 is one of the biggest year-to-year jumps in basketball gaming. When you see just how much of a jump it made from Showdown 94 or the or just Showdown, the uh, Super Nintendo version, to Live 95, uh, not just going to the isometric camera angle, but also, as you say, the, the pace, being able to sprint, having that turbo button uh, just changes the game so much. It was not the first basketball game to have sprint or turbo. Jam had it at least two years earlier than that. So, but but it just makes so much of a, of a difference. Uh, the pace, uh, the fouls, not not just colliding into somebody and getting an, an offensive foul, <laughs> you know, or, or a blocking foul. Uh, nine times out of ten, that a player brushes against another one. But you know, I I didn't grow up with the uh, the NBA playoff series because I uh, I got into basketball and basketball gaming a little bit later. So NBA Live '95 was my first game in the series. I know that you and many others around our age, did play those uh, older games, whereas I've gone back and played them in uh, in retrospect. So it's kind of been that reverse for me where I've played the, the newer game first and then been able to appreciate the improvements uh, retroactively. But, but you know, it, it's, it's still fun to go back and play those games. When you pull off a move, when you get into the lane and you sky for a huge dunk, it feels good. It's satisfying. And, and that's the, the essence of basketball gaming, that you pull off something like that, even today throughout time with basketball gaming that you when you pull off something and it just feels so good and it and it looks so spectacular it pumps you up doesn't it it really does um i got pumped up on your first dunk even though you were against me i was using the blazers he was using the bulls um with your first one-handed jam with pippin and i'm actually gonna upload our gameplay to the nlsc youtube so people can see the highlights of the game we're talking about on this show and I also had, with Chris Dudley, a move where I caught the ball <laughs> yeah. in, the, in the post, and I did a quick spin move to the rim and threw it down with two hands. That was exciting. Like, that was a really fun play. It felt good on the sticks, and um, I thought it looked great in game. Um, we talked about it, uh, you know, a couple times before. Uh, the Sega Genesis version of NBA Showdown uh, is better than the Super NES version. It's smoother. Um, the gameplay seems to... Uh, flow a little bit better the animations play out smoother etc so um i think the two things that i noticed the most with um nba showdown 94 that they really improved on in nba live 95 is one with nba um, showdown 94 everybody kind of moves at the exact same speed Mm, yeah and there are so there's really no differentiation but at the same time there are no fast breaks ever. Like we played that entire game and there was not one fast break. We tried. And that's because we tried, but that's because everybody's playing at the same speed. Um, and there's nobody, you know, who leaks out that the, the, the game's not smart enough at that point. Right. In order to implement, you know, AI players that think that way. So, um, you know, there were no fast breaks our entire game. The game, I think I told you, I said, while we did have fun and it was a competitive game, it kind of felt dry, right? Yeah, that's a good way of putting it, yeah. Right, and I'm sure they had those conversations behind the scenes with EA Sports. Like, probably sat at a table and whatnot, and they were like, listen, we got to make this game fast. We got to make it fun. We got to make it, you know, there's a lot of excitement around NBA Jam at the time if you remember correctly, obviously. Definitely. Uh, and, you know, we want to make it so people are talking about NBA Live, maybe even with the excitement, like they talk about NBA Jam. So they pumped up the speed. They get, they implemented turbo. There's alley-oops, you know, going to the rim. There's super exciting alley-oops. 
how cool is that in the NBA live games where they, you know, you go baseline in like NBA live 95, 96 and you throw a pass and he goes flying in for like a one handed slam with or two handed with the point you know, afterwards you, as well. Obviously with the pointing after, right? Exactly. Yeah. They added stuff like that too. They gave the game kind of spice and attitude. So it, attitudes are it, a great word for that. Yeah. Just that, uh, that oomph to the gameplay and that, that feeling of the, uh, the excitement of, of NBA basketball, for sure, the uh, just getting that speed, as you said, was so uh, so important. And uh, and yeah, originally they were going to call NBA Live '95 NBA Showdown '95. They were going to keep that showdown name. But uh, Rod Redekop uh, was talking to me uh, on the podcast when we, we had him on, and uh, when I had him on the the show for the uh, 25th anniversary celebrations, and, and he said that there was a discussion, and they realized, you know, we want to we want to uh, rebrand the series, which didn't work so well later when they went to NBA Elite 11, of course, obviously, but back in the day, they were making a big positive improvement with Live 95, and, uh, you know, what's a, what's a name that uh, really says, uh, really gets across what we want to uh, uh, portray with this game, you know, it's, it's like live basketball, and of course, NBA Live 95, is, it uh, flows and, and rhymes and everything, so it's, uh, it, was, it was a good choice, the uh, NBA Live name. It was perfect. Um and yeah, like NBA Live 95 just screamed NBA action. Even something as simple as like the pointing, right? It's yeah. that attitude. It was the attitude. It was like, you know, wrestling had the attitude era. That was kind of like the attitude era kind of for the NBA, right? Absolutely. The, ni- the 90s were. Yeah. Right. So the other thing that stood out too while we were playing um, was the charging calls are ridiculous. Um, I jumped like into you and they were like calling you. F- for charging <laughs> i know that our friends josh and dave um you know from namo gamo who made basketball classics they said that that's the thing they hated the most about tecmo super nba basketball was the ridiculous charging calls but to be honest with you nba showdown isn't much better it's it's a very early uh, it's an early 90s basketball gaming thing kind of thing it's uh it's something that didn't really work out until again live came along and and really really changed the game Oh, yeah, 100 percent. And and I think the other thing that stands out of an NBA showdown 94, which I always thought was weird. And Mark Price, legendary NBA player, commented about this when I shared the highlights of him on Twitter. Um, I thought that was a cool interaction, just being able to talk to Mark Price and have him comment on something that I posted. Um, But he was like, why am I left handed? (laughs) Because in NBA showdown 94, for Sega, like every player is left-handed. I noticed that, yeah. So, yeah. So I posted those highlights on Twitter of Mark Price lighting, uh, me lighting up the computer with um, with Mark Price just hitting threes from all over the floor. And mm. Mark Price was like, ha ha, you know, why am I left-handed? And that was his response. So I think it's cool that he was watching a video that I posted of NBA Showdown 94 of him lighting it up on the virtual hardwood. And, you know, that was his comment. Well, it goes back to uh, what our friends Nate and Roger, the Live 2001 legends, of course, uh, said about their interactions with NBA players, that uh, they, they are these old players are, are watching these highlights and reminiscing about their days in the NBA and their early forays in, uh, in video games. And I'm sure some of them did play games and, and saw themselves in games. And uh, yeah, years later, looking back and yeah, why am I left-handed? Why, why do I have black hair when I'm... Uh, Steve Kerr had black hair when he very famously does not have black hair. Uh, he is quite blonde, or certainly was as a uh, as a twenty something in the NBA at the time. So there were little inaccuracies like that, or I think John Stockton was blonde in one of the games as well. So it's it's fun to look back at that stuff, but you don't want to be too hard on these games at the same time because in their time, this was really cool to to get onto the virtual hardwood and play with real NBA players. You go back to the earliest basketball games, and you're just playing with generic players. You talk about a, a double dribble or something like that. Fictional teams, generic players, generic nameless players, not even a, a, a super dunk shot where you have a Jordan and Pippin and <laughs> all those other fake players, just nameless generic players. So to actually play with NBA players was a big deal, and that's something we always have to keep in mind. And also, despite the the uh, primitive nature of that game, again, we just had a fun session with it. Uh, what, 20, almost 30 years later? Hey, we had some good highlights. That's going to be a really good video when it goes up I'll on I'll check YouTube. it out, yeah. Yeah. I think people are, are going to like it. Um, I will say this, uh, you know, to go back to what you said about like kind of our basketball gaming lives. Mine started earlier than yours, like you mentioned. Um, I started with double dribble. Mm. I started with Jordan versus Bird. Um, Bulls versus Blazers was a huge thing in my house. Um, we had NBA showdown for Super NES. That got a ton of play. I started a season um, back then with on Tecmo Super NBA Basketball. 
you know, for the Super NES. And I, I was using the Pistons in that season. And it was Isaiah Thomas, Joe Dumars, Orlando Woolridge, Dennis Rodman, and Bill Lambeer. And um, we had Brad Sellers and John Sally on the bench. And that game famously, um, you know, for the time actually had player portraits in the game. Not like real pictures, but digitized faces. That's right, yeah. Like and it looked really cool, but John said that there was some there were some in the game that were like kind of copy paste, especially for like bench players. And John Sally and Brad Sellers had the same face, um, so we always called them twins. Like they were the twins because of that, you know, when we use them and then we put them on the floor. But it is it's funny how that works. Like my my lead up to NBA Live '95 was entirely different than yours, and so were my expectations. Yeah, right. And that's, it's funny uh, that you remember little details like that, don't you? From from games back in the day, that like having those identical portraits because they did uh, cut some corners, I guess, with some of the bench players. That you do remember little things, little details like that. Uh, all these years later, it's uh, it's one of the wonderful things about video game nostalgia in general. I think having uh, having those memories of those strange little details as well. Like I think of Live ninety five with uh, if if you have the on super nintendo and uh, i believe genesis as well if you have you've got the portraits in the game but if you reach half time and you've got the the key plays of the half and there's a bench player two either two bench players or at least one bench player is a player of the half it replaces the portraits with the jerseys because there's no portraits for the bench players so you don't have like a portrait and a jersey it'll switch to the jerseys for for both players or and again if player of the game at the end if it's a bench player it will be the uh the jersey rendering rather than the the non-existent portrait for a bench player so they're just one of those little details that uh that i remember and uh it's it's cool that stuff like that sticks in your mind really is uh also lakers it's you know where john stockton was blonde i'm pretty sure that was in lakers versus celtics yep. in the nba playoffs. that's the one yep yeah he's blonde and which is really odd um but yeah you know like my expectations for nba live 95 live 96 Honestly, I didn't know what to expect. You know, I was young at the time, and I probably thought we were just going to get another showdown type game, right? Um, but when I say that we were surprised, that's an understatement as far as how much they changed the gameplay, how much it was revamped. Um, it felt like a completely new game, right? A whole new series, even though technically it was still part of EA Sports basketball games. So, um, yeah, it was a pleasant surprise. And obviously they, you know, they kind of took off from there and had that golden era of mid late nineties, that, that whole run. And then they kind of picked it back up with live 2003. Oh, for sure. And, and, you know, I do miss that. The feeling that every year that was a, an exciting release and and what are they going to bring this year? And, oh, they, they pleasantly surprise us with this and blow us away with that. And I guess there is that in, in, in 2k over the years as well. Over the past decade or so, I think I have become a bit more cynical about that. There are reasons for that. Now, I also see some of the younger gamers in the community saying the same thing. So it's not just, oh, bitter old head uh, expecting too much. But it's, I think we're at a point with games where there's a, a consistent level of, uh, of quality, which is nice. But it, it just doesn't blow you away anymore. And I think we, we, we came along at a time uh, with our childhood that... Uh, that we had these games that we loved and, and there was that constant improvement as technology was very rapidly improving that from 95 through to, uh, from MB Live 95 through to MB Live 2000, there are some huge changes. Even year to year, there are some huge changes. Well, that's what I said that um, has really gotten stale about 2K actually since 2K18 is it feels like um, every game just kind of runs together. Mm. In a way, I think I feel like the gameplay just is kind of like running together for the most part. Disposable every single as well. Like, um, the live, yeah, service con- con- live service content I've makes them disposable. Word. Yeah, yeah, I've heard that. Yeah, like disposable games as well. You've heard that word used a couple times now in the community. I, I've talked about it before, but the PS4 generation of NBA 2Ks um, up to 2K17, I thought was very you know special and unique. Because NBA 2K14 and 2K15, there's a pretty big difference between those two games. From appearance, for some, from some of the control, uh, the menus, all of that stuff. Then obviously 2K16, which is one of the most popular games, 2K games ever made. Some people say that it's the best basketball game they ever made. Um, that was a big jump with adding you know, a four size up system. You know, 2K15 didn't have that, so you had your side to side size ups. You had your back and front size ups. Um, they added um, 
you know, new gameplay mechanics related to the post game, being able to, you know, drop step and throw it down instead of just throwing up a layup because those mechanics, you know, the drop step and dunking wasn't there in 2K14 and 2K15. So they added a bunch of stuff. They changed the look of the game. They changed the body models. They changed the menu system. 2K16 still has one of the most unique menu systems I've ever seen where the player, there's like a live player who like throws a ball or something like that. It's like Steph Curry and Jordan and whatnot. And they're like part of the menu system, like the virtual It alternates versions. between the three uh, the three main cover players cover. and then uh, right. MJ as the uh, Legend Edition or the... Or, right, because then there's James yeah. Hart, right, yeah. Anthony Davis, et cetera. Um, but anyway, so then they had NBA 2K17, which brought in different lighting from 2K16. It brought in, for better or for worse, different body models. Um, it took away the four size ups, but made dribbling the way it was. And with the, you know, the one size up, a little bit smoother so chaining together dribbles overall felt a little bit better um but it felt like 2k14 i think you could agree through 2k17 it felt like you were getting like excited for the new release because you never knew which direction they would go in right and then since then it's just kind of gotten stale and the games feel very disposable and that's a shame It's it's a shame we feel that way it's a shame we don't have the same opportunity to develop nostalgia for these games i mean i'm thinking what what is the last 2k that i felt very nostalgic for and it would be 2k 17 so we, we are talking about pre 2k 18 here and uh, funnily enough speaking of 2k 18 I, I have picked up 2k 14 again and uh and playing through my career i'm alternating between that and 2k 23 i'm at the point where i'm not playing 2k 23 exclusively but still want to play it so it's still in the rotation and kind of juggling it with 2k uh, with 2k 14 but I'm almost further in the 2018 season of my career in 2K14 than I ever got in my career of 2K18, which is kind of crazy. Yeah, I noticed. I, like I told you, when you went back to NBA 2K14, I think it was to grab a couple screenshots for an article and whatnot, I, I said, you're going to start playing games. Yes. And sure enough, I started getting highlights from Andrew <laughs> yeah. from his uh, 2K14 my career, and he's getting steals and he's throwing it down on the fast break, doing a 360 one-handed jam. Um, you know, you're showing me highlights before he got hurt of Terry Hansen and whatnot. And I'm just like, I said to you in the chat, I was like, listen, it's very clear, and I'm sure you would admit it too, that the NBA 2K14 gameplay is still just more fun than say 2k23 or or 2k22 etc it is I, I would rather have the uh, the content of 2k23 with the gameplay of 2k14 right and that's understandable because of how much content is in 2k23 it is absolutely loaded um and then you put on 2k17 briefly as well and um i know that you were just testing out Marillus action to see you know how the time shift was working and whatnot but you sent me some highlights and man some of that stuff still just looks really good like i i still love 2k17 is still the go-to for my brothers and i oh that's very pick up and play no i i, I um i enjoyed that as much uh, as uh, 2k14 I, I didn't uh play long because i was just testing out and going th- going between a few different games on pc to uh to test out the uh test out Morales action but yeah, 2K17, I'll, I'll happily revisit that one as well, anytime. So uh, why don't we talk about Terry Hansen's injury? I know it's bothering you. Uh, for those oh, who don't, oh man, yeah, <laughs> maybe first-time listeners of the podcast, Andrew's in Season 5 of his NBA 2K14 My Career on PS4. And, you know, a couple of years ago, Terry Hansen was the draft pick. And it was a rough start for a few games. Terry Hansen wasn't playing that well. Andrew was a little frustrated with him. And then he fell in love with his rookie at the time. And and Terry Hansen ended up being uh, a star and kind of like a Jordan Pippen role with Andrew and um, became very fond. He said, I believe Andrew has stated that Terry Hansen is his favorite character in any video game. I think so. Uh, Any basketball uh, basketball game. Yeah. Right. But then he uh, let me know with tears in his eyes that Terry Anson early in the season is now out for the season with an injury. Yeah. It's, uh, it's certainly taken a turn in year five and it's funny how every year so far in my career, 2K14 has had this, uh, had this subplot or had overarching storylines either presented by the game itself or just simply through the, the action and whether there's been players injured or whatever. 
So the first year, uh, the rookie year, obviously, was about was pretty much driven by the, the narrative that's in place and the, the story of being drafted and missing those first two games, being benched for those first two games, and then finally getting an opportunity when, uh, when a, a starter goes down with an injury in the fourth quarter, and then you get a, a chance to play and impress, and then it's becoming a star. So the first year, becoming a star, leading the team to the championship, underdogs, etc., out of nowhere. Year two, okay, now they're they're taking me more seriously. Uh, established as a star, Camilo Anthony comes over, uh, signs, and, uh, and then he he joins us, and we win a, a second championship. Uh, year three, as you said, Terry Hansen joins us. It's a bit of a rough start, but then he I really warm up to him. Uh, I'd, I'd lost uh, Jason Richardson, who I really enjoyed playing with, uh, having as a teammate there, and as the uh, as the veteran teammate who made me wear the clown nose at uh, <laughs> in a cut scene the first year. Um, kind of a bit of rookie hazing there, but lost him. That was a shame, but Terry Hansen just stepped in and eventually became this uh, this great player. Uh, Camilo Anthony goes down with an injury in the playoffs. He's going to miss most of the of year four. Uh, as Terry Hansen steps up, becomes an all-star, averaging 30 points alongside me, also averaging 30, so the two, two teammates averaging 30 plus. Uh, so that was really fun. And then year five, uh, Melo is back. Uh, MCW is back. Michael Carter-Williams is back after he gets injured in, in year four. And uh, he's back in action, and Mello return. Mello goes down early in the season with a concussion, and uh, that brings uh, MCW back into the starting lineup. And after Mello comes back, for whatever reason, Hanson, who is averaging almost thirty points a game again this year, thanks a little bit to my passing, obviously, and <laughs> feeding him the ball, but he gets benched, and now he's on the bench as the seventh man, uh, twelve minutes a game. This is really weird. Uh, so he comes in and only plays about five minutes for most of this game, and then he's back in the fourth quarter, and then he goes down with a knee injury, and it's the season. A torn MCL. So now I'm stuck on this team, playing for zero VC, apparently, because I've automatically re-signed for a, a contract worth zero, which is a, a bug with 2K14 in my career on the PS4 and X1. Unfortunately, I've did a bit of research, looked up some YouTube videos, and uh, yeah, it's not just me. It's not an offline thing. This was happening when there was online uh, servers and online VC as well. So yeah, now I'm stuck with uh, with uh, MCW starting a point guard, moving me over to shooting guard, with uh, Terry Hansen out for the year. Mello is back in action. He's doing, doing well, of course, because he's still in his prime, more or less. But uh, I'm actually starting to think I'm going to have to start throwing my weight around behind the scenes and and try to get some people traded or the, or the coach fired because, yeah, this is kind of the uh, a controversial year. It's turning this is the this, the uh, the story of year five has turned into this uh, yeah th- this sort of frustrated four time MVP who's going for a, a fifth straight championship. Yes, but there's all this other stuff going on in the background and feeling a bit disrespected by the the coaching choices and whatnot. So yeah, I might be uh, throwing my weight around a little bit more, or worst case scenario, might be moving on. We we'll, we will see. So how can ownership? not see the beautiful and special chemistry that you had with Terry Hansen and understand that, like you stated, the, you know, for you, the four time MVP, you know, four time NBA champion, it's about making you happy. And by making you happy, that means keeping Terry Hansen in the line, in a starting lineup, playing big minutes with you. It's been proven success. Like that's, that's proven success with that formula. So benching him would send any superstar in that situation into kind of a frenzy kind of like an emotional frenzy so um yeah that is wild and you know a body in motion stays in motion so wouldn't be surprised if he tore his acl because he went in cold exactly yeah like all of this resting stuff um like in real life and then obviously we're also at the height of injuries we've never had more injuries in the nba you know and that's you know play that's with players resting the most they've ever rested before and you know not practicing as much and whatnot i'll always say you know, one of the biggest reasons for anybody to get hurt is muscles not being ready to perform, your body not being ready to perform, your body going in cold and whatnot. So if you want to equate Terry Hansen's injury to, you know, real life, that's a good example. Body in motion stays in motion, and Terry Hansen was not ready to go into the game. He wasn't warmed up at that point. That's what I felt, yeah. Full speed yeah. and tore his ACL. Yeah, that, that's how I, how I feel, which is why I'm thinking of uh... – getting uh, Johnny Davis uh, fired. Although, that being said, I did have a, a GM meeting at the end of uh, November, just finished November last night. In, in previous games and the 
last gen slash PC version of 2K14, the GM meetings were something you could ask for at any time and bring up these issues. I'm not getting along with a player, not getting along with a coach. I want more time. I want an extension, etc. In the PS4 X1 version of 2K14, it's just it's just something that's that's set up at uh, at fairly regular intervals, random at the trade deadline. So you can there are times you can ask for a trade or at the end of the first month. How do you feel? How do you feel with the team's going? How do you feel about the team? And you can bring up these issues. And I did chicken out. I did because I was I was all ready to ask them to trade MCW, but then that option wasn't there. It, it, sometimes it's there, sometimes it's not. Uh, it was I'm not getting along with. I don't like the job that coach is doing. I almost picked it. I, and I, I chickened out the last second. I said, okay, look, I'll just say I'm, I'm happy for the moment because we are 15-0, and 0, so it's 14-0, 15-0. So it's a, a pretty good start, obviously. But, you know, we'll see how it goes as the uh, as the season wears on. I, I think I'm, I'm going to have to uh, get uh, get rid of MCW, uh, as, as toxic as that sounds, because it, it's just not fun. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a point guard. I'm a playmaker. Uh, every time the, there's an inbound, I have to then call from the ball, call for the ball from him. So that's kind of annoying, and it doesn't really help the uh, the offense flow. Bring it, bring it up in the half court. So yeah, it's uh, it's it's gonna be interesting how this uh, this year plays out. And it's it's uh, as, as frustrating as it is to have that injury to uh, Terry Hansen. I do like that it's setting up this scenario where I can role play a bit, and and, and yeah, it's, it's a different story that's being shaped by the events of what's happening in the gameplay, rather than oh, uh, I'm I've got to be an influencer and deal with this toxic hor- horrible rival in 2K23 story that it where it feels like it's on rails and the the city hates me even though I'm putting up 20 and 10 off the bench in uh, less than half a playing less than half the game it uh it, it feels less phony it feels more organic and uh that that's it that's something that I really do appreciate so stay tuned people you know does he stay does he go does he get his coach fired does he try to make it work by you know getting you know forcing his way at changing up the roster and everything does terry hansen come back healthy for season six or does he come back for the playoffs possibly so yeah we'll definitely see but how cool is it to put on a game like you did with nba 2k14 have that that first screen show up get into the menus hear the music you know and get that feeling of excitement it's oh, not yeah. just a great feeling. It's like you, when you put on a game that you genuinely have fun with, that you can't wait to take the virtual hardwood on, and that you have a lot of memories with. Just booting up the game is an experience. For me, that's uh, Live ninety six PC because of that uh, the golden presentation and that ticket coming out uh, on the main menu. That, that I just yeah, so much nostalgia with that one. Definitely. So another game that I get nostalgic for and be alive two thousand three. You and I uh, visited that recently, actually. Uh, we talked about it on the last NLSC podcast. We played all-time Lakers versus all-time Celtics. We were the Celtics um, against the CPU, you know, a work-in-progress roster, but people seemed to enjoy those highlights, and we had fun playing it. That's another game that I put on, by the way, and it's, of course, that amazing soundtrack that went platinum. The classic menus, the you know, just the whole presentation, everything. It just screams NBA basketball, NBA action. Uh, I connected with, yes, his name is this, Juicy Shackme for the first time. He's a modder from the NLSC, and he's done a bunch of modding for NBA 2K11 yes. and whatnot. And he, he, you know, he was working on like classic teams for that game and everything, and he does an outstanding job. But him and I actually connected on Parsec. He had never used Parsec before, from my knowledge. And um, I hosted, and we played NBA Live 2003 for the GameCube. And, um, yeah, it was really fun. We played on the same team. Uh, we were the Rockets and we played against the Suns. So, um, we had Steve Francis, uh, you know, Glenn Rice, Katino Mobley, um, the, you know, late, great Eddie Griffin and whatnot. No, Yao. Yeah. He signed too late. Calvin Cato. He signed too late. So Calvin Cato is our starting center, um, and whatnot, but, you know, we ended up blowing out the computer in that game, and it was just a ton of fun. It's Juicy Shack Meat had a dunk with Steve Francis where he jumped over Stefan Marbury, <laughs> yeah. which um, looked just absolutely amazing. He truly clears him on that dunk, and that was the number two play in the NLSC Top 10 Plays of the Week this week. 
And, you know, I was knocking down threes with, you know, Katino Mobley at a steady rate and, uh, you know, he had a huge dunk, um, you know, from the post with Eddie Griffin and whatnot. It, those rosters are so nostalgic. I'm so nostalgic for those rosters. It was a great time to be an NBA fan. I absolutely love the early 2000s and whatnot. And I'm glad that, you know, the game worked well for him and that we were able to have that experience. Yeah, I was trying to pick which version you were playing because I noticed you had Kato rather than, than Yao. So I thought, well, it can't be PC because he was, the PC version came a bit later and did get him in. He's actually in the game as Ming Yao, so they can have Yao on the back of his jersey. They figured out how to do that later later on, have it round the right way both ways in later games. Uh, I've never found out what, where the flag is in the database. I'm still looking for that years later, but they did actually figure that out But uh, or made exceptions for that but yeah he is ming yao actually in uh in, in live 2003 pc but yeah I was, I was trying to figure out which version it was so gamecube uh that makes sense um but yeah that 2003 rockets team uh what a what an interesting video game team that is and, and love to play with them again in 2003 uh pc with uh, with yao as well but i was looking it up uh, last night i think they went 44 and 38 something like that uh missed the playoffs in a very tough western conference that year if i recall correctly but yeah, what what a uh, what a fun underdog team to play with. Yeah, I actually added the O two O three Rockets to uh, my NBA two K seventeen Classic Teams roster. Oh, that's right. Yeah, and they're really fun to you know throw on the floor and whatnot because they also have like Maurice Taylor and uh, Juicy Shackney actually uh, threw down a one handed hammer dunk on NBA Live two thousand three with Maurice Taylor. That is absolutely something that Taylor would do. I don't know if people remember, but Maurice Taylor was one hell of a player super talented power forward um you know for that rockets team but yeah revisiting nba live 2003 has been a lot of fun lately thinking about having a tournament on it and i know that you might be interested in participating in that but i did want to point out i brought up the win that juicy shack meet and i had with the rockets versus the suns and we did blow them out but the game before that which was our first game playing on the same team we got absolutely destroyed by vince carter and the Raptors, but specifically Vince Carter. I got to show the highlights of that at some point. He was throwing it down on us all over from all over the floor. Like I, it's a, such a different variety of dunks, super powerful dunks. We were getting absolutely destroyed by Vince Carter. We, we got blown out in the first game. We tried to play on the same team against, you know, the Raptors and whatnot, but yeah, he is absolutely deadly in that game. And maybe that's kind of some foreshadowing because he was the cover athlete for live 2004. Of course. Yeah. It, it, it is very hard to stop high flyers in live 2003. Basically once you get into the lane and, uh, and, and, and sky for a dunk, uh, well, the CPU can usually stop you on a higher uh, difficulty level. It, uh, it will, it will get very cheesy with its, uh, offensively and defensively, but it was, it was definitely overpowering offense in Live 2003, as we were discussing last week with that arcade-leaning direction. But, you know, you were talking about Live 2004 last week as well in comparison to uh, Live 2003 and, and what it ha- does better and uh, what uh, Live 2003 arguably does better than 2004. And 2004's physicality can be a bit overpowering at times with those two-man animations. You can tweak it a bit with the sliders, which, of course, came in that year as well. But it is easier to, to, to have physicality in the paint, with those animations and with that 10-man freestyle that they introduced in Live 2004. With Live 2003, you still got those uh, tin cans bumping into each other, uh, physicality. Those are the collisions, basically. Don't, you don't have any kind of uh, semblance of ragdoll physics. They're not actually ragdoll physics in Live 2004, but for lack of a better term, there is that, that kind of an interaction that's more than just, a, again, like a couple of uh, tin cans uh, bumping into each other. But yeah, you get up for those dunks, and uh, it's very hard to stop. It's hard to stop the dunks. But it's the, the, the doing the dunks and actually watching the dunks are just super satisfying. I think NBA Live 2003 is just awesome for dunking. It's loud. Oh, yeah. The animations are excellent. You can perform some wild stuff. Like, remember that time I took uh, took off from beyond the, th- the free throw line with Julius Irving? Oh, for sure. And yeah. it was in the top 10 that week and whatnot. Uh, and speaking of which, actually, before we get to the mailbag, um, what a great top 10 this week. Explosive. Top 10. Yeah, so that, I think that's the word I used when I was talking to you about it. Uh, it was explosive. You know, huge dunks, exciting plays, 
you know, a really great tip in a switching hands tip in with Josh Smith on NBA 2K17 and elbow pass from uh, on NBA 2K23 from um, at a problem on Twitter. Um, B-ball video games with the Kevin Johnson game winning three from NBA 2K23 against the Celtics um, using the error rosters. Um, we got you with the steel and 360 dunk from NBA 2K14. Um, me from 2K22 with a uh, double cross with Kobe and two uh, dunking on two people in traffic. It was a great top 10, great submissions, and it was super exciting. That uh, that top play, the the game winner, I sent it to you when you uh, when you sent me the draft. Uh, or said, you said the draft is up, and uh, I always get a, a sneak peek before anybody else does, just to rub it in. Um <laughs> I I said that maybe one of the the only times or one of the few times that that uh, green release cut actually looked good. That was a, a really good presentation element in that scenario. I enjoyed that. Also, the commentary. Yes, yes. The commentary was absolutely perfect. It went right with the action, spot on. It was super exciting. It was a great way to to end the top ten presentation with that as the number one play. Uh, I also wanted to point out that we had a couple highlights in there where real audio was used. One was the NBA 2K19 uh, Stildo 33 highlight Penny with Hardaway. Penny Hardaway, yep. um, where Penny Hardaway got by his defender and threw it down on Vladi over Vladi Divac, not just on over yeah. Vladi Divac. Um, which Penny would do? Such a which Penny, great, would, which young, Penny would do? Young Penny would do that. Yeah, he could get up. Yeah. It was a great highlight, um, but the the audio that I put to that highlight was actually from Penny Hardaway versus the Pacers in real life, where he had three or four big dunks in one game, and that's audio from his dunk, uh, one of the dunks on the Pacers. Um, and that scream you hear in the highlight was actually Penny screaming. So I thought that was really cool, and it kind of went with that 2K19 play. And then yours, the 2K14 um, steal and you know, with your, my player with Andrew, um, and you know, then the one handed three sixty dunk, where did you pull that audio from? So I had to, uh, check myself on this one. I had to look it up again. It was a compilation of, uh, three sixty dunks from various NBA games, uh, over the years. And it's actually a, a Terrence Ross, uh, three sixty in game. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I had to cut it up a little bit, cut out the names that are being mentioned, but no, it, it worked. It worked out perfect. Um, you would never tell that you edited it and like cut out names and whatnot. Uh, but yeah, no good stuff. I love the top 10. Uh, that was actually week 74. Uh, it's been going strong for 74 weeks and I haven't missed a week yet, you know, putting it out and whatnot. And I think that, you know, it just keeps getting better and better. Isn't that crazy? 74 weeks. Like the, the, we're on week 74 at this point. Yeah. I mean, you and I are coming up on our 150th podcast together. Yeah. Two weeks in, on, in yeah. a couple of weeks yeah 150 podcasts in three years um that is just absolutely wild and it's been a great three years uh and you know like we're not stopping anytime soon no and we've been getting some uh, great responses as we said we read a couple of uh, very kind reviews last week uh people interacting with the content on, on twitter youtube and of course commenting on the articles and in the forum uh and again uh, thank you so much to everybody who's uh who's interacting with us because we we love doing this content uh, we love basketball video games and we love that you love them as well and that you're uh, willing to share those experiences with us 100 percent. but uh, speaking of uh, community interactions derek how about we see what the mailman has for us to the mailman the bump face what an unbelievable dunk twenty dollars andrew before we even get to people's responses twenty dollars what if you had twenty dollars to spend Pretend you don't have the collection that you have mm. right now, but you've obviously played the games before. What game or games would you buy with that twenty dollars? So, assuming I could find both for a combined uh, twenty dollars, which which I think I probably could on eBay, uh, NBA Live Oh Six PC and NBA Live Ninety Six PC. Oh, absolutely, and you could you could find both of those. I think for so. under twenty dollars, so, including yeah. shipping too. Yeah, like I think. Um, You'd be able to do that. Isn't that wild? You can get those two games, those two great games with, you know, countless hours of entertainment that you would get out of them for 20 bucks. Oh, for sure. Like, that's and, pretty and, wild. And it's it speaks to the problem with digital only releases. And I know I sound like an old head when I say this, but the fact that you can get your hands on Live 96 PC, NBA Live 96 PC 
so much easier than NBA 2K17 PC. Like, unless you find a, a seller on the gray market, a third-party reseller, you're not getting 2K17 PC anymore. Yeah, I, I feel so bad. There's a gentleman on our Discord who I've actually connected with before on NBA 2K17, and we had a fun time. But obviously, I was hosting because I own the game. But he can just not get his hands on NBA 2K17 for the PC. He there's no he can't find any codes, US codes, mm. out there. Um, he you obviously can't walk in and you know grab a PC disc version because they don't exist, etc. And they removed it from the Steam marketplace. So 2K17, which sounds like it's to me like it's his favorite. 2k of all time he just cannot get it for the pc and he's super bummed about it speaking of steam uh, re- removing the uh, 2k games for a while there 2k 10 11 and 12 were still available on steam and i regret not picking them up uh, i was trying to find a, a, a reseller for 2k 11 uh, in particular and i found one that was selling it for three thousand australian dollars and look i love 2k 11 derek but not three thousand dollars worth of uh, 2k 11 Right. You wouldn't spend that anyway, but especially because you already own 2K11. I do, the disc version, yeah. So, I mean, for simplicity's, <laughs> right. yeah. for simplicity's sake, I, I wish I got the Steam version so I didn't have to uh, switch discs and, and so forth, especially with this weird stuff that's happening with my 2K10 discs, both of them stopping working and stopping recognized by every PC I have, oddly. I have no idea what's going on there. But in any case, got, I've, I've managed to get it working, got a workaround for that. But yeah, I, I wish I got the Steam version when it was available, which was about twenty dollars as well. So I mean, I would have done that back in the day. I, uh, but I dragged my feet and said, "Oh no, well I'll just wait and uh, you know get pick it up some other time when I've uh, got a bit of extra money uh, lying around." But nope, it's, it's you got you got to act quick, Derek. As you know, with eBay as well, uh, if you want to collect, sometimes you got to be patient. Sometimes, but other times you got to act now. You got to act fast. See, I got lucky because NBA Two K Eleven when I did get it for the PC, it wasn't available on Steam. But it was available on Amazon. Mm. So there was the, you could download the digital version. So what I did was I bought NBA 2K11 off of Amazon. They sent me a download link. And I downloaded NBA 2K11 to my PC. And what I did in order to have them all lined up on Steam, I've sent that screenshot before on social media where it shows 2K9 all the way up to 2K20 two at the time, but now obviously 2K23. Um, but I added the um exe to my steam library so now i can just boot up 2k11 from my steam dashboard mm. so it's just like a like like it's like if i had bought it off of yeah. steam i, I so, believe i believe i can do that with my copy but i still have to have the disc in there so it's sort of popular. and i don't yeah. so yeah i got lucky yeah um but then i think it was like a week or two after i bought nba 2k11 off of amazon they stopped offering the digital download yeah so which is unfortunate. But yeah, it is wild, though, that what you can get with 20 bucks. I will say that. Yeah, you've pointed out some great deals over the past few shows with uh, these deals that you can, if you are savvy and you look around for some of these uh, great deals on eBay, uh, maybe there are a lot of people just selling these old games for a few dollars, just want to get them out of the, out of the house, out of the collection, <laughs> clear the space for uh, other storage, and are just putting it up there for a few bucks. But also the, uh, the auctions as well. Sometimes you can get a, a great deal there, but... There's a lot of classics that you, you don't have to pay through the nose to uh, to get them. Right. Like I've said it before. Uh, I got 2K14 for PS4 for two ninety nine at GameStop, right? You can pick up NBA 2K17 if it's still sitting at a GameStop for just a few bucks. So, like, technically, if I wanted to spread out my, you know, where I buy and whatnot, I could probably get, you know from GameStop and then a couple or ordering a couple games, I could probably get 2K14, you know, P the PS4 version or Xbox One version. I could probably get 2K17, 2K16, all three of those for under $10. No joke. Like maybe $10, $11 or something like that. And then I could order a couple classic games for four or five bucks as well. So I could probably get like four or five really great games for 20 bucks that would provide me with endless hours of entertainment, which I still, it still just blows me away. There's so many quality classic basketball games that you can get for cheap. And again, most of these games are more or less completely intact. Whereas even if you were able to pick up a 2K17 PC, if you were able to get your hands on a Steam key, 
uh, a lot of the content is not going to be there. The, the roster up updates aren't going to be coming through. Uh, you're not going to be able to play uh, the, the full version of my career. It's, it's still a fairly comprehensive version with the story, actually, of uh, 2K17, one of the last that we can actually play through the story offline. But my team's not going to be there. So there's, a, there's going to be a lot of content that you can't play uh, in those games. Right, exactly. I think that's the biggest bummer, right? With the newer 2Ks, they're even removing the My Career story. Disposable. Yeah, Again, so the, yeah. yeah, so the good thing that is, you know, you know, with games like 2K14 and 2K17, at least you have that stuff intact. Exactly. Right? And you can still use it and play it. I mean, obviously, you can't play my team and whatnot on, like, 2K17, but you could still play, like, the My Career story. You can still do all of your roster editing and roster saving. And then if you're on PC, we figured out how we could even share rosters, which is what I did in order to release my Ultimate Classic Teams roster, all of that stuff. So um, there's still so much content that you can sink your teeth into. And you know that with 2K14 because, hell, you're on Season 5. Yeah. And you've gotten you know, hundreds, you know, probably thousands of hours of entertainment now off of NBA 2K14 years after it was the current release. And as we've said before, years after I kind of poo-pooed it, put it aside. Right. I just, I'm, uh, I'm not going to say use the word proud, because I feel like it's a little weird here, <laughs> but um, I'm impressed there you go. with your turnaround with NBA 2K14, the fact that you did go back to it and you gave it a fighting chance. And then you realized that you were like, all right, I was wrong. You know, and and that's OK, because I think I've done that with games before, too, where I've you know, I had a really bad first impression or maybe I had ill feelings towards developers at that time. And then I went back and played it and I was like, you know what, this game, this game is better than, you know, I thought it was when I first picked it up. Absolutely. No, that, that's exactly how I feel. And I think it is it's why it is important and, and valuable and uh, and just just plain fun to go back and check out these old games look not all of them impressed retroactively uh live 07 for example xbox 360 live 07 is uh I, I haven't really changed my mind on that that much uh I, I do think it's fun to revisit with you and mess around with because we can laugh at it like a kid sports basketball for example or, or live 07 <laughs> xbox 360 that we can have fun with those rough games in that context but as far as games that we uh, want to revisit often yeah, there's a lot of games that you can uh, overlook that first time or they just don't make a, a good first impression for whatever reason, put them aside for years and, and dust them off and, and maybe you've got a better attitude towards them. Like 2003 for me, you know, it, it wasn't as sim as I wanted back in the day. Now I can enjoy it for what it is and have a blast with it for what it is. So yeah, I, I'm all for revisiting these games. And of course, they, they're also valuable for the future as well, as we've said before, because you can look at ideas they had and say, hey, this would be a great idea to bring forward. How could we adapt this for modern games? So there is always value in going back and looking at the past. I still have this dream, Andrew, of coming into a bunch of money, creating my own basketball game, forming a marketing team, which I would absolutely ask you to be part of it as well, um, and just just making a great basketball game. But this still, it's still in the back of my mind. I still think about it. So how many, how many years before you start putting uh, microtransactions in and just start really disrespecting the audience? Well, I honestly wouldn't even make a game if it if I that was like if that had to be part of it. Yeah. So yeah, um, that's you know me, you know me very well. You know like how I operate kind of in my personal life as well, and like you know the way like my how my thought processes work, and you know everything that I say on this show, I mean, right those are my real feelings and whatnot. And I hope our listeners understand that I'm being honest about that stuff as well. Um, micro transactions. If I ever made a basketball game would just not be part of it, no matter what. And they, and they shouldn't be. It's a shame. They're so uh, ubiquitous in gaming these days. Right. And by the way, if I ever come out with a basketball game and put micro transactions in it, remember this episode so you can call me out on it. But yeah, that's not, that's not something that I would do. But uh, to get to the question you pose to the community, uh, you have $20 and decide you want to use it on a basketball video game, and if possible, more than one. What games are you picking? If you if you were to order online, show the listing of the game in the comments. So we've given our suggestions, so let's turn it over to the uh, community's responses now. Uh, first up, our friend uh, Roger says, uh, <laughs> uh, I would buy NBA Live 2001 10 times. Yeah, I'd believe it. And he could. Because NBA Live 2001 you can find for very cheap. Probably could, yeah. And... Um, yeah, they love that game so much, Nate and Roger, and they've been on the show a couple times now and whatnot. I love their dedication to that game. So that doesn't his answer doesn't surprise me. 
at B Ball Video Games uh, mentions NBA Inside Drive 2003, which I know you've been uh, revisiting uh, a fair bit recently. My brother and I love NBA Inside Drive 2003. It's a forgotten title. Nobody talks about it today because it's not 2K or live and whatnot. Such a well-made game. Super exciting. It's been in the top 10 a few times now and whatnot. We're over 30 games into a season on that, playing every game on the same team, 12-minute quarters and whatnot. We've gotten hundreds of hours of entertainment off of it recently, and it hasn't gotten old yet. So, yeah, Inside Drive 2003, underrated game and a great choice. And his second one, because, again, that was under the $20, uh, second one was NBA In The Zone for uh, PlayStation 1, which you and I revisited uh, probably about maybe about a, about a month ago. Yeah, we had fun. That was a good one. We had fun with that game. Yeah, it was a good one. Um, I think that uh, it has a vibe. That's what I love about NBA In The Zone. It's a whole vibe. The game is a whole vibe. The music that plays in the bas- in the background, you know, between like during quarters and whatnot, and how it changes up the 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 menu music, the the presentation that '90s presentation and everything. Like I'll say again, the game's a whole vibe, and when when it's like that, the game is c- kind of it, it comes off as unique. It's a very unique game, so I also think that's a good choice. The only downside of, of that one that they, that they did fix an NBA in the zone two the passing the, the, yeah, the you, got, you got passing. it in one yeah yeah having to uh, select the passer and uh, the recipient rather and then uh, then pass that slowed it down they did fix it up in uh, in the second one but that's that that's the only real drawback of what's otherwise a, a pretty fun game to re, to revisit and uh, that whole sim arcade hybrid. I like to think of it as because it's a little bit exaggerated with the speed and a little bit exaggerated with the dunks going above the rim a, a little bit, not NBA jam style, but certainly a little bit more, uh, a bit more casual than what say live was doing at the time and some of the other five on five games, but that's fine. It, it's a, it's a, as you say, it's a vibe. It's, it's a great uh, approach to that hybrid style that I think, uh, that I, th- I think that would still work today. It's entirely different than the live series. Like the gameplay is very unique. Um, And I think that's what makes it really stand out. I think also it's really tough to stop people in that game. I think defense is very hard to play. I think that's the other weakness. Um, Mm. It feels like, you know, when somebody gets to the hoop, you really, you know, starts trying to drive to the hoop, you really don't have any chance to stay in front of them. And you hope to get one of those loud blocks, but you just, they're like flying towards the hoop and doing these acrobatic dunks. And it doesn't really matter who it is, they're all doing that same acrobatic dunk and whatnot so i think it lacks a little bit in differentiation i think it's very hard to you know play defense but the game is still fun and next up we have scorpion soldier gaming and these are a couple of great ones here nba live 10 and nba 2k 11 if i just want to use 20 dollars on two games yeah i'm all for those choices too right i think you can find both of them for under 20 i think 2k 11 um can tend to be on the more expensive side depending on where you're trying to get it pc can just be, yeah. for the fact yeah. yeah yeah depending on what platform and where you're trying to get it because nba 2k 11 is still considered one of or or the best you know basketball video game ever made but yeah you could have endless fun with live 10 and 2k 11 i'm guessing maybe people were starting to go towards digital at the time or there's maybe not enough uh, physical copies in circulation because those 2K11 copies do seem to be very expensive. Same with 2K10, actually. Uh, and, and I suppose, you know, Kobe Bryant's uh, Tragic Death is, is probably pushing up the price because he's on the cover of that game as well, 2K10 this is. And, uh, and, and of course, if, it, if it's sealed and if it's the anniversary edition, if it's the uh, with Kobe on the cover, of course, I've seen people putting that on eBay for $150, which for a fairly common game, it shouldn't be the case. Uh, the Xbox 360 and uh, PlayStation 3 versions tend to be much cheaper, but I'm guessing the PC version, there's not, not enough copies in circulation that it's uh, kind of become a bit of a rarity. Or, or again, maybe it's a uh, uh, they're pumping up the price artificially, but I have noticed that the PC versions of those early uh, 2010s, 2Ks, uh, so, so some of the last few uh, that had physical copies uh, seem to be a bit more expensive. Yeah, I've noticed that as well. I think that... Uh... PC obviously has the advantages for modding, number one, because there are still mods for those older games that are available on the NLSC forums and whatnot. And two, they do look better and look smoother on PC as long as you can max them out. Indeed. So I think there's also the visual advantage of having it on PC. And like you had also mentioned, you know, if you can get it to run without the disc and whatnot, there's also the 
the access bonus, the ease of access bonus, where you can just click on, a, you know, on an icon or, you know, throw it in your Steam dashboard and hit play. And you don't have to be shuffling around CDs or like replacing CDs and whatnot. So it definitely, PC definitely has its advantages. Faster loading times. Much faster loading times, absolutely. And uh, Scorpion Soldier Gaming also has a, a second suggestion here, uh, like 2004, 2005, NBA 2K7, and NBA 2K8. And I reckon you could probably get, uh, if you shop around, you could probably get those four games for a total of 20 bucks. Yeah, you definitely could. I've talked about the deals that you can find on eBay and Amazon and whatnot on prior shows. It's very possible for 20 25 bucks to get all of those titles. And I'll say again, I know I feel like I'm beating a dead horse with this, but it's just endless hours of entertainment. Um, you, you know, those, those games have a lot of different game modes in them. Um, a lot of different content You can play full seasons, go into the playoffs, et cetera. Um, yeah, it's just, it's a lot of basketball gaming fun that can be had with those titles. King J Mace has a couple of good ones here. NBA street volume two or NBA live 2003 on PS2. And I believe that, uh, the Mace has said that live 2003 is his first basketball game or one of his first basketball games. And, as we've been saying the last couple of weeks, uh, we love that too. And of course, NBA Street Volume Two, uh, a contender, another contender, along with Two K Eleven, in many people's minds, for the uh, best basketball video game of all time. Right. So Live Two Thousand Two was King J Mace's first basketball game, and that's then right, Live Two Thousand Three right. um, took it to the next level. I believe that he liked that one more. Um, that's right. Yeah. And finally, somebody mentioned an arcade game. I was like, I, you know, I was waiting for somebody to mention that uh and when i say arcade i can mean like arcade or street or whatever um nba street volume two a steal for under ten dollars and you can easily find that for under ten dollars if you look um look hard enough and whatnot and it, it i still say it is the best street game basketball video game ever made and it is in contention for the best arcade basketball video game ever made right there with nba jam on fire edition so it's like for those, those two are my favorite arcade go tos. So this uh, this Looney Tunes Beeble Erasure will not stand. I know, Tiny Tunes Acme All Stars can't compete either, Andrew. It's <laughs> unbelievable. But th- those games still uh, they still kind of can be fun and whatnot. Those the cartoon basketball games and whatnot. Next up, we have Gilbert's Grape. Uh, says NBA Live two thousand five, NBA Live two thousand four, NBA two K eleven. Another vote for NBA Street Volume two. And Bulls versus Lakers and the NBA playoffs. So spanning uh, many years there. And, and again, many classics. Notice a theme here with a lot of this. Um, Mid-2000s lives. And when I say mid, I say like 2003 to 2006. So mid-2000s lives and early 2010s 2Ks. There's a little bit of a theme here. And I think that those were two very strong eras for NBA 2K and NBA Live. A lot of people's favorite games come from those eras and especially for the nba live series um it felt like you call it the second golden age for nba live but nba live 2003 through 2006 was just everybody was talking about nba live at the time right like it it was the commercials were on tv all the time for those games you know they were in everybody's homes etc in everybody's minds nba live was so big at the time and they were releasing so many great games I mean, 2K was starting to get that momentum, of course, and, and some of the critical acclaim, but it was only either console, it was console exclusive, and for a while there it was uh, Sega exclusive as well. Uh, it wasn't on PC, and we had the PC modding community, so within our community, certainly anything that wasn't on PC was kind of overlooked. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, Live was, was king at that time. It, it wasn't until uh, Live 09 was uh, dethroned by 2K9 in sales that, uh, that Live was number two in sales, even if it had been surpassed in critical acclaim. So people do forget how uh, Live was uh, so big in uh, among basketball gamers. It, was, it had a bit of a pop culture awareness, along with the other EA Sports games, of course, and, and was very uh, well regarded, rightfully so. Through that, uh, as you said, what I call the, uh, the second golden age for NBA Live, if you, if you want to look at, uh, and I'm, I'm, with apologies to Nate and Roger, Live 2001 and Live 2002 as kind of small missteps or, or tiny, the tiniest step backwards as they rebuilt on, bra- on a brand new engine, on, on brand new code. Uh, they, they, they did make some improvements, certainly on, on PC in uh, the, the following years. So, I, I mean, I think, I think that was a very strong era for Live from 
Live 95 through to Live 06 PC. So, I mean, even the lows during that point were still pretty damn good games. But to your point about the early 2000s, I do think that's when you've got the maybe the oldest games that are readily accessible for a lot of gamers that, that kind of resemble a modern game. And they also don't have any of the modern... They have some of the modern conveniences, but also none of the modern inconveniences like uh, DLC and uh, season passes and live service content and uh, and microtransactions and whatnot. So that's where we're seeing the, uh, the the nostalgia at this point. Right. I will say this about NBA Live, the early 2000s. I think that Live 2001 and Live 2002 can be considered overall some of the weaker games gameplay-wise in the series. I actually prefer NBA Live 2000 over both of them by a, I would say, probably a decent margin. I think NBA Live 2000 was an incredibly strong title for, you know, the PS1 and PlayStation 2. Not to say, again, that I can't go back and play NBA Live 2001 and Live 2002 and have fun, because I have. And you and I have connected on those games. Absolutely. And we have had some good sessions. But I think that they were adjusting to a new motion system, like you had stated, a new system in general. And um, those were, there were some growing pains during those couple of years. And then NBA Live 2003 just feels like an entirely different game from Live 2002 in a pretty much every facet. Um, it's one of the biggest changes in gameplay that I've seen ever in basketball gaming history for in a one-year cycle. I mean, the, I can't even believe it. The, the adoption of the right stick dribbling, it was... And it's not yeah, even just that. It's, the, it's just, it's all, it's like the animations in general. Oh, true. Right. Everything that you could do on the floor and how it flowed and the pace of everything. And just it, it, NBA Live 2003 and NBA Live 2002 play entirely different. And finally, we have Tony Styles Jr. says NBA 2K2, NBA Live 2003, another vote for NBA Street Volume 2, NBA 2K9, and NBA Live 10. So yeah, we're, we're, again, we're seeing where the, uh, where the nostalgia lies these days for, uh, for basketball video games. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're talking again from 2000 to like 2010, right? And maybe a little bit into the early 2010s, like a couple of people have mentioned 2K11. But it seems like that was the pinnacle for a lot of people of basketball video games, that 10 to 11 year stretch from year 2000 up. And you do also notice that during those years, there was competition and choices in the space. Right. How many times have we talked about that? You know, the there's, you know, yeah, yeah, they lie. Right. And, you know, in the early 2000s, you still had NBA in the zone coming around. Then you had, you know, NBA Inside Drive coming out. You had NBA 2K and then you had NBA Live and then you had the NBA Starting Five games and and you had the um, NBA Shootout games, all of that stuff. Like you you had all of these different options. And I do want to point out, since this is a $20 uh, spending limit, that I did get Kids Sports Basketball for five dollars. And that did that did feel like four dollars fifty too much. Yeah, I um, I would say that that game would be under a buck in worth. Yeah, that's my opinion. But you know what? We had I think that was session. the budget of the game actually as well. Right, exactly. Well, like you said, it's like a reskin soccer game. Yeah, that's basically, basically. What that is. Yeah. yeah. So thank you for all of those answers. Uh, again, some very common themes there. It's clear where the nostalgia lies at the moment for, for basketball gaming. Kind of lining up with my nostalgia at the moment as well, Derek. Yeah, I um, I got to be honest with you. And my team for NBA 2K23 is getting a little dry. The gameplay is a little dry at the moment. So I found myself again seeking already. I know that's not a good sign because we're only in like the second month of the newest 2K. But I found myself again, you know, starting to play some of those classic games find myself you know jumping on nba live 2003 with juicy shack meet right on parsec connecting with you on nba showdown 94 um you know when you know playing solo throwing on games like nba 2k 17 um you know playing nba live 2003 solo nba live 2004 like I love having the collection that I have because I can go back and play all of these games and get, you know, new or familiar experiences with them. But um, it does bum me out a little bit that the gameplay is getting a little stale already on 2K23. So hopefully that turns around. I, I'm really hoping that turns around. I know what you mean. Because again, going back to 2K14, part of me is like, yes, this is really fun. But at the same time, I'm thinking, oh, but I was, I was quite enjoying 2K23 and I 
I've been talking it up, obviously, in recent shows as well. So I, I do want to play that. I, I'm sure I will. I think the, the difference between 2K23 for me and 2K21 and 2K22 is that I do want to play 2K23. I will go out of my way to pop it in and play some more my team and play some my career and, and jump on with the guys as I did the other night. Even if I'm only playing it a couple of times a week, uh, that's still way more than I was playing uh, 2K21 and 2K22 for most of uh, their life cycle. So the fact that I see it as viable, I think, is such a huge improvement. I'm willing to, to throw it on there. But I've, I've reached the point where I've play, been playing it a lot for the first month or so that it's been out. I know I'll play it more in the future, but now I'm ready to to dip back into other games as well. Yeah, I think um, NBA 2K23, where I'm going to get the most fun and play out of it, is just my co-op season with my brother. Mm. You know, just having fun with that Legends co-op, my NBA. And we're going to probably play that tonight when, when I'm done recording this podcast with you. So, yeah, I think that um, I still got my money's worth and everything. But I've said this before. The gameplay on the last few games, you know, 2K releases like 2K20, 2K21, 2K22, and now 2K23. It's just not a game that excites me in a big way on the sticks like i don't get like super excited to throw it on and it's just going to be a title where when we're done this year's cycle and whatnot for the game that i'm probably not going to go back and put it back on for a very long time because i don't i don't i don't have this feeling of wanting to put on 2k20 i haven't wanted to put it on at all 2k21 2k22 the same thing i don't know that's probably the same way it's been with you but i've had no like itch to put on those games well, the gameplay yeah. for all these games all just kind of like runs together. There's nothing super exciting about it. The gameplay mechanics frustrate me more than they, you know, excite me and whatnot. Like I don't look forward to putting those games on. So it, that's the difference. Like I can put on 2K17 and like look forward to it. 2K14, look forward to it. 2K13, live um, 04. Like I can put on those games and be like super excited still to put them on, but I don't have any interest in playing 2k20 up to you know 2k22 now like i just don't have any interest in it well i'm the same i don't have anything that really draw me to those games even 2k 2k19 and 2k20 i would because i had my careers going in those games they're not accessible so i don't really have any reason to revisit them and and play them because yeah there's no uh, there's nothing there's no save file there's no nothing to continue nothing to pick up and continue like there is in 2k14 with my uh, my career uh, I don't have that, and oh, I might revisit them out of interest, or to, certainly to get screenshots for an article or, or whatnot, or or footage uh, if I'm doing some kind of a video feature in, down the line. That's the only reason I can see myself really revisiting those games uh, for for content creation purposes, for my own enjoyment. There's nothing to draw me there because of the uh, the inaccessible saves now. So yeah, I, I have they are disposable. They feel very disposable, which is a shame. Two uh, K seventeen backwards. There's, there's actually reason to go back and play them 100 percent. and mods don't hurt either for a certain pc games. absolutely yeah right so nba 2k19 with my season would still go 33 where you know we're playing the 94 95 season mod and would i be playing nba 2k19 solo without the mods probably not absolutely actually absolutely not i wouldn't be revisiting that game um but because i have that season with the ken because of those great mods and everything it gets me to you know have a little bit more fun with the game and like have a shared experience but thank you again for those responses and uh, keep the conversation going let us know in the in the comments here on the uh, on the youtube channel on the nlsc or on social media yeah keep keep by letting us know which games that uh you would pick up for $20 or, or less. And, and yeah, if you have any uh, cool retro pickups, uh, let us know about that as well. Yeah, and hopefully Andrew got more than $20 for his birthday. So maybe he will pick up something new. Maybe. You know, and then <laughs> we'll talk about it on the show. But uh, that has brought us to the end of this week's show. As always, we thank you for tuning in and invite you to join us again next week, either on the NLSC, mbslive.com, our YouTube channel, or your podcast app of choice. In the meantime, please connect with us on social media, that's where you can get in touch with us and, of course, stay up to date with all of our content. To then, Derek, I will throw it over to you to plug those handles. Absolutely. Uh, you can reach me on Twitter where I'm the most active at D for 384 and at D for 3G. Again, I got talked into, you know, creating a you know handle on TikTok. I'm D for 3 over there, and I've been placing the top 10 videos on my TikTok channel. Um, I'm also on YouTube, D for 3, and on the forums, D for 3. I am Andrew in the forum and Andrew NLSC on Twitter. 
the NLSC is on Twitter and Facebook as well, at the NLSC. Our Instagram is NLSC Basketball. Our aforementioned YouTube channel is youtube.com slash NBA Live Series Center. And of course, keep it locked to the NLSC itself, nb-live.com, for everything we do for basketball video games. So, thank you once again for tuning in, and until next time, I'm Andrew. And I'm Derek. Go get buckets, everyone. <laughs>